Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And after the last couple of synods, nobody's going to disagree that things are really getting messy in the Christian Reformed Church. So we're having conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We're dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. It's also important for you to know that you are our marketing plan. We rely on you to spread the word about what we're doing at the Messy Reformation. We rely on you to share our content. We also rely on you to give us five-star reviews and provide good feedback for our podcast so that the algorithms push our content out into the world. You are our marketing plan. You can also support us financially on Patreon. All the money from Patreon is being used to fund online hosting and to build the platform of the Messy Reformation. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode coming right after one of my vacations, which is why it's a day late. In this episode, you're going to get a sneak peek at what happened at the Abide Convention a couple weeks ago. This is the message that I gave at the convention, but more are going to be posted over the next few weeks on YouTube including the video version of this talk. So stay tuned for all of the content posted from Abide over the next few weeks. Father, we come into your presence thankful that you're our God. And thankful that you've called us to be your people. Um, Thankful for the opportunity to gather here together with fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord thankful for the fellowship that you've given us, thankful for the strength um, and the opportunity that you've given us in this moment in the CRC. Um, And Father, we know that if it was up to us, we would have failed and fallen short long ago, but we know that you've been working, you've been upholding us, you've been strengthening us, you've been leading us and guiding us, and we're thankful for that. And Father, we pray that you do that now again um, as we come to your word this morning. That as we come to your word, that you would speak, and that you'd speak clearly, and that you would cut through right to our hearts, that we would truly hear your word this morning, truly hear you speak, um, and that we would leave changed as a result of that. So, Father, we pray that you would speak clearly this morning, and that we would hear. And all God's people said, Amen. This is my fighter of a wife, actually, Uh, getting me water because I was drinking coffee all morning and uh, that just doesn't cut it. Um, It was about 10 years ago. I don't remember the exact day. About 10 years ago, um, I found myself sitting at my desk at my house about one in the morning uh, with my head in my hands, uh, weeping. And uh, our church had been in a really intense conflict for about seven years. And uh, many of us had been working really hard to try to help kind of lead our church from a position that was very not healthy to a position of of health. And it was moving and things were heading in the right direction. And we were excited. We thought we're going to get there. And there was this moment coming up where we thought this is going to get us there. We're going to finally break through all of the conflict that we've been dealing with over the last seven years. And we're going to move beyond that. And we're going to finally be in a position of health as a church. And so there was hope and there was excitement. And then a small group of people in the church who had power and influence and political maneuvering Um, didn't want the church to go that direction. And they used all of their political power, they used all of their influence, and completely destroyed everything that had been worked on. Um, This may sound familiar, but like five or six people overturned the work of 80% of the congregation. And it was devastating. And uh, one of my friends who had been kind of working closely alongside me through all of that, Uh, called me up after that moment and he was just in tears and he said, 
like how much, how much longer? Like, how much longer are they going to do this kind of stuff? I don't know how much longer I can put up with this. Maybe we just need to leave, start another church. Like, is this worth it? Um, I just can't take it anymore. And, uh, and I remember going, yeah, me neither. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm weak. I, I couldn't sleep. And so I went off to my office and I just started kind of weeping in the middle of the night. And, uh, and then I started to pray. And uh, somebody had given me really great advice early on in my life and my ministry. They said, when you're in kind of one of those moments, uh, you don't know what to pray, like open up to the Psalms start praying the Psalms. Um, and so I did that, uh, but I didn't open up to a random Psalm because I kind of knew what I wanted to pray. And so I, I opened up to Psalm 13 because I knew I kind of wanted to pray that. And so I have a quote, it might be a little raw, but this is directly from my like prayer journal. I said, how long, O Lord, will you forget us forever? How long will you watch this crap go on and do nothing? How long will you let these people run roughshod over this church? I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of fighting. I need to hear from you before I lose hope. I don't think I can go on any longer. Will you let them win? But then I stopped and I had to stare at my Bible for a while because the next line that I was supposed to pray, I didn't know if I could pray it. Could I say, I have trusted in your steadfast love. And I just stopped. The other words came really easily. (laughs) Um, That's why I went to Psalm 13, because I wanted to say, I wanted to cry out to God and say, like, do something about this. I didn't want to come there and be corrected and rebuked and taught and trained in righteousness by Psalm 13 and to be faced with the question, am I trusting in God's steadfast love right now? And the answer was no. Uh, That's why I was so despairing. I I had realized that, that I had been in the midst of this kind of battle and this kind of fight for the church. And I had been repeatedly relying on my own strength. And, And I had been, so caught up in all of it that I kind of had forgot how faithful God had been in my life and how faithful God had been in the life of this church. And I stopped relying on him and thought, well, I can do this because I'm pretty good. And then I realized I couldn't. Um, And I hadn't been trusting in God. And so I, I'll be honest, I've learned something over the years. Like you don't say words to God unless you actually mean it. (laughs) He, He has no... He doesn't like hypocrites. And so it took me a while. I stared at my Bible and said, can I pray that I'm actually trusting in you right now? And eventually I repented, confessed, sought the Lord's forgiveness. And I wrote, okay, I have trusted in your steadfast love. I'll continue to trust in your steadfast love. You will lead your church. And that's, Really, the, the question I want each of us to be kind of wrestling with this morning, uh, wrestling with as, as we leave here, that, that as we're leading reformation in our own churches, as we're leading reformation in the CRC, are we trusting in ourselves? Or are we trusting in the steadfast love and faithfulness of our God? Because it's easy for us to say, if you go to, I don't remember what slide we're on, maybe there, nobody's up there. Um, it's easy for us to say the words of what my talk is. It's easy for us to say, he who promised is faithful. But it's a lot harder for us to actually live that way um, and to fight that way. Um, And so the question for us is, like, has that truth of the faithfulness of God, has that so penetrated your heart? that it's completely changed the way that you live, completely changed the way that you serve, and changed the way that you fight for reformation in this church. Um, I was thinking about, uh, this is, I probably have one of the easiest messages of, of the conference because probably the most indisputable statement of the entire weekend is, he who promised is faithful. (laughs) 
right? Like nobody doubts that, right? We, we look back and we say, when God promised a son to Abraham and Sarah, was he faithful? Absolutely. When God promised to, to Joseph, I, I will give you a position of leadership and authority, was he faithful? Was it easy? Was it smooth? Was it hard? Yes, it was hard. But was God faithful? Yeah. When, when God promised to Israel, I'm going to take you out of Egypt and I'm going to bring you into the promised land, was he faithful? Absolutely. Was it easy? Was it hard? Was it messy? Yeah. But was God faithful? Absolutely. When God promised, I will place someone on the throne of David forever, was he faithful? When God promised, I'm going to send a Messiah. He's going to come. He's going to live. He's going to die. He's going to rise again so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be cleansed, so that you could be renewed. Was he faithful? When God promised that he would crush the head of the serpent and that he would destroy Satan's kingdom and establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, has he been faithful? And the one kind of particular for us here, when God promised, I will build my church, has he been faithful? And will he continue to be faithful? Absolutely. And yet, even in light of all of the kind of indisputable evidences of God's faithfulness, we have the audacity and foolishness to trust ourselves and not trust God. And what happens when we trust ourselves? We all of a sudden realize, I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. There's too many enemies. There's too much work to do. And, and then we despair and we quit and we give up because we realize we're weak and unstable and unfaithful people. And we're like, I need to go somewhere where it's easier, where I can do something. Now I'm about to say something hard. I told my wife I had to dress nicer today because you have to look a little nicer if you're going to say hard things. This doesn't come across in t-shirt and shorts. Um, And I'm not saying this lightly, but I'm saying it because I think I need to hear it. I think we all need to hear this. Um, There's this sentiment that I've been hearing a lot lately. It's almost become a proverb that institutions leak left and break right. And everybody just says it. Like, this is the way that it is. And I think that should be a rebuke for us as conservatives. Because what that's telling, saying of us, we're the ones who quit first and walk away. We're the ones who become despairing and weary and leave and look for greener pastures in some other institution, some other denomination, we leave. And it should be a rebuke. And I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what's behind that. Why? Why do we do that? Um, And I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But I can tell you one thing. When I look at my own heart um, and the reasons why I become despairing, want to leave, go start a new church, start a new denomination, walk away, it's because... I've stopped trusting in the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. And I've relied on myself. And and I think we as conservatives, or whatever the heck you want to call us, need to take a really hard look at our hearts and ask ourselves, am I trusting in myself? Or am I trusting in the steadfast love and faithfulness of God? Are are we dreaming of heading off to greener pastures, easier denominations, easier churches because we're trusting in ourselves? Because when we truly get this deep down in our hearts, that that when we get that that promise that he who promised is faithful, when that's right here, we hold fast. That's what our passage says. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. That's how we hold fast. That's how we stop wavering. Because we know that he who promised is faithful. That's why we don't walk away. That's why we don't give up. Because we know that our God has promised things and he's been faithful over and over and over and over again in your life and throughout the history of the church. And so we hold fast. We don't waver. And we stand firm. Now, I'm going to take some time to... This talk is going to be different. Um, uh, which is kind of funny. Brian's talking about how I found it. there's going to be plenty of scripture, but I'm also, I want to take some time to kind of show us how that truth has worked itself out through history. Um, and this probably won't surprise many of you, but what I want to show you is how that truth worked itself out in John Calvin's life and his ministry at Geneva. Um, and and I, before I dive into this, I just want to encourage you, like, not right now, wait till I'm done talking, but then go on Amazon, buy the four volumes of Calvin's letters and read them regularly. Um, that has been one of the biggest helps to me in my ministry at my church um, and, and in the kind of fight for reformation in the CRC is just reading Calvin's letters. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through some of Calvin's letters and, and help, help us kind of understand What helped him hold fast in Geneva? Um, And I think we kind of forget. We we always like to look back on history with kind of rose-colored glasses. And and we try to think of Geneva as being like this little piece of heaven. Like, man, if I could have only been pastor there, that would be awesome. Um, And I don't, John Knox probably didn't help us, right? Because John Knox said... Cal, uh, Geneva was the most perfect school of Christ that was ever in earth since the days of the apostles. And so we're like, man, that would be awesome. Um, and yet there's two things to remember. Um, one, it did not start that way. And two, Calvin never thought it was that. <laughs> Even on his deathbed, you'll get to hear some great quotes from him on his deathbed. And it's important to remember when how difficult Calvin's ministry was in Geneva. Um, You know, he was there for, I don't know the exact timeline, but I think it was like two and a half years first, and then they kicked him out. (laughs) He went off to Strasbourg, did some ministry there. They called him, then then they said, no, come back. And, And here's how he described his first two and a half years in Geneva. This I can truly testify that not a day passed away in which I did not ten times over long for death. And he says, he says, I could truly testify this to you. I'm not even exaggerating. I wish to die ten times a day in that church. Uh, the next quote, he said, wherever you turn your eyes, you may find innumerable causes of lamentation. And, of a, and while of certainty, I see no way of putting an end to it. So I, I look at this church, and everywhere I look is problems. And I have no idea what to do about any of it. I have no solutions to bring here. I have no idea how to move forward. I'm just completely lost here. My favorite is uh, how he describes his ministry on his deathbed. So he's, he's on his deathbed. He's going to die in like a day or two. He brings all of the ministers of Geneva to him. And then he describes how hard his ministry has been in Geneva. He says, when I first came to this church, I found almost nothing in it. There was preaching, that was all. They would look out for idols, it's true, and they burned them. But there was no reformation. Everything was in disorder. I've lived here amid continual bickerings. I've been from derision saluted of an evening before my door with 40 or 50 shots of an arquebus, which is a muzzle loader. People are shooting off guns outside of his house in the middle of the night. 
How think you must that have astonished a poor scholar, timid as I, as I have always been? Afterwards, I was expelled from this town and went away to Strasbourg. And when I'd lived there from some time, I was called back hither, but I had no less trouble when I wished to discharge my duty this time. They set dogs at my heels, crying, here, here. They snapped at my gowns and my leg. I went to the council of the 200 when they were fighting. I kept back others who wanted to go, who had nothing to do there. And then I entered, people said to me, withdraw, sir. We have nothing to say to you. And I love this. I will do no such thing. Come, come, wicked men that you are. Kill me. My blood will rise up against you. And these very benches will require it. (laughs) Amen. He says, thus I've bid amid combats and you will experience that there will be others not less but greater. For you are a perverse and unhappy nation. (laughs) That's on his deathbed. It's kind of a correction to John Knox, like little piece of heaven. Calvin's like, no, they're really a perverse and unhappy nation. And things are going to get worse after I die. It's a hard, hard call. Um, Also really applicable to us is to remember um, one of Calvin's primary struggles in Geneva was implementing church discipline. Primary struggle. That's why he got kicked out the first time. He was trying to implement church discipline too quickly and they booted him out of the city. Um, But he he writes this kind of tension and and the first time, so when he was there, right before he got kicked out, he wrote this about church discipline. He said, this however I'll venture to throw out in passing that it does appear to me that we shall have no lasting church unless the ancient apostolic discipline be completely restored, which in many respects is much needed among us. We've not yet been able to obtain that the faithful and holy exercise of ecclesiastical excommunication be rescued from the oblivion into which it has been fallen. Right? Hear the tensions? On the one hand, Calvin's saying, I know discipline is necessary if we're ever going to have a healthy, lasting church. And on the other hand, he says, we haven't been able to rescue it. It fell into oblivion and I haven't been able to do anything about it yet. He has this other great line um, where he's talking about the beauty and the power of discipline. He says, doctrine is the soul of the church for quickening. So discipline and the correction of vices are like the nerve to sustain the body in a state of health and vigor. Right? It's necessary. It's essential. It has to happen. And yet he said, I've been struggling for this for a while and not getting it. You know, after, so he he was there for two and a half years, kicked out, called back to Geneva, starts working again, and he continued to struggle to get church discipline in Geneva. He he said after his first year in Geneva, he said, my chief, he's writing this to Philip Melanchthon, which I think is kind of great. He says, my chief regret is that there does not appear to be the amount of fruit that one may reasonably expect from the labor bestowed. (laughs) I've been here, I don't know how many pastors have been at their church for about a year. (laughs) Like, I've been here for a long time. I've been working really hard. I don't see any fruit from it. And we know that part of that is discipline. He was working to get discipline. He said, I haven't seen any fruit from that. And, and you know, we, we kind of know this line where we say, okay, well, we overestimate what we can accomplish in a year and we underestimate what we can accomplish in five to 10 years. So maybe if we look like 10 years down the road, Calvin will be saying, discipline's great. No. 12 years later, he says this, those desirous of living a life of licentiousness have not ceased for the past seven years to oppose the discipline of the church, which is in a tolerable state of efficiency here. Twelve years after a second call. We're talking 15 years of influence and ministry in the church. And what I find interesting is 12 years into this second call, he says, for the last seven years, people have been fighting against discipline in this church which tells you that the first five years, discipline probably wasn't strong enough that it bothered them. 
And for the last seven years, it was enough that it bothered them, but Calvin still said it was tolerable, not great. After 12 years, a hard call, weary, exhausting. And yet, he said, I never, ever thought about deserting my call in Geneva. Never crossed my mind. Um, I'm going to expand on a quote that I shared earlier. He says, This I can truly testify that not a day passed away in which I did not ten times over long for death, but as for leaving the church to remove elsewhere, such a thought never once came into my mind. Never came into his mind. And so the question is, why? What held him fast, right? He has, what held him fast is he had people sicking the dogs after him as he walked down the street. What held him fast is people were shooting guns off outside of his house in the middle of the night. What held him fast when he had people holding swords up to him as he blocked the table and said, you shall not partake of the Lord's Supper. You will kill me. I'll let you hear it from his own words by expanding on another quote. He said, wherever you turn your eyes, you may find innumerable causes of lamentation. And while of a certainty, I see no way of putting an end to it. My courage would entirely fail me if this single thought did not sustain me. That whatever may happen, the work of the Lord is never to be deserted. Notwithstanding in the midst of so many evils, the Lord from time to time bestows somewhat that refreshes us. And to put that in words of our passage, what held Calvin fast in Geneva? He knew that he who promised was faithful. That's what held him fast. He goes on, he says, this one thing comforts me, that whatever may happen in desperate circumstances, The so utterly unbridled rule and dominion of the wicked cannot exist any longer unchecked. And the Lord, as you truly observe, will at length vindicate his own cause. There are many influences at work, both at home and abroad, more than enough, and many more spring up daily, which would not merely weaken, but entirely crush us if we were not well aware that we are fellow workers with himself in the reformation of the church. In our deepest misery, therefore, this consideration has sufficed to support us that Christ has once for all obtained the victory over the world, the fruit of which deliverance we may at times partake of. He held fast because he knew he who promised was faithful. He held fast. He stayed in this difficult call because he knew that Christ promised he would build his church. They had victory over this world and he was faithful. And so Calvin didn't leave. He didn't run off to try to find a different call. Didn't run off to try to find a different denomination, but he held fast and he faithfully ministered and God blessed it beyond anything he ever asked or imagined. I don't have that in here, but at the beginning when Calvin goes, he's like, when after they kicked him out the first time, he said, let them do the work. Nothing's gonna happen there anyways, basically. Because he held fast, remained faithful, God blessed it. And he blessed it beyond anything he ever asked or imagined. And it's a reminder for us that when we stop relying on ourselves and start relying on the one who promised and who's faithful, we're strengthened. We're firmed up to stay and to fight. That's what happened to Abraham. Romans 4 says, he didn't weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. 
No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. When Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised, when God was, when Abraham was fully convinced that he who promised was faithful, said he didn't grow weak and waver, but he strengthened, stood firm. Even when, literally, there was no conceivable way that the promise could be fulfilled. Even though he knew there was no physical way that this would happen, it didn't make any sense, he still was fully convinced that God promised and God was able and that he would do it. And so he said he was strengthened because he was fully convinced. He believed it right deep down in here that he who promised is faithful. Um, And it's time for us to start doing that. Um, it's time for us to really believe that he who promised is faithful and hold fast, stand firm, and fight. Um, And it's time for the conservatives to stop leaving and stop relying on ourselves. I want to hear, I had a great conversation at Synod where, whatever you want to call it, but a progressive person came up to me and said, why don't you just leave? I was like, you don't know me, do you? (laughs) I want to hear more of that. The conservatives don't leave. They stay. They fight because God is faithful Not because we're smart, not because we're strong, not because we have some political maneuvering going on, not, has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with our God. And He's promised, and He's faithful. So we stay, and we fight, and we let that give us strength. You know, Calvin said this to his, uh, to the ministers, you know, after giving this long explanation about how hard it was to do ministry in Geneva, he said to his, the ministers, he says, but take courage and fortify yourselves for God will make use of this church and he will maintain it. And he assures you that he will protect it. He who promised is faithful. So hold fast, stand firm. And fight. Um, And I want to make that clarification because I think one of the misunderstandings that often happens when, whenever I preach a message like this in my church or to a larger group, um, people think holding fast and trusting in God is a passive thing. And uh, we kind of have this temptation to be like, okay, I trust that my God is faithful. He promised to build his church. I believe that. So I'm going to sit back and let God build his church. That's how much I trust him. I'm going to do nothing and let him build his church. And that's not what God calls us to. That's not what it means to hold fast. Holding fast means holding fast while we pursue reformation. And not just in the denomination. I'm talking about reformation in your heart. (laughs) Reformation in your church. Then, if we have reformation in our heart and then reformation in our church, then it might trickle up to classes and then it might trickle up to the denomination. But we don't just sit back and do nothing. It's It's a working and a trusting together. And... And we have this tendency to kind of fall off one side of the other. We have what I've been talking about this morning where we, we work, but we don't trust. 
Or we come over here and we like trust God and we do nothing. And we're to hold them together. It's more like Philippians 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation. Live out your faith. Why? Because God's doing it in you. Fight for reformation in your heart, in your church, in your life. Why? Because you can do it? No. Because God's doing it in you. He who promised is faithful. So fight. Work. But do it. Trusting that he who promised is faithful. Not that you're faithful. Not that you're strong. It's this paradox of the Christian faith. Where when we actually finally admit that we're weak. And can do nothing. But that our God is strong and powerful. We're actually empowered to do powerful things. Because you do things that are way beyond your abilities. Because you're not relying on yourself, but you're relying on your God. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Right? It's never been easy. It's always been messy. And actually, if we do this, things will get harder. Because we'll stop running away from the hard things. And we'll actually have to stay and fight. And we'll actually have to stand fast in the middle of the storm and stop thinking about running off to greener pastures, stop thinking of coming up with excuses, but actually stand. Hold fast. I'm not sure I understand. I know. (laughs) Hold fast when we're frustrated and angry, hold fast when we're suffering, it's difficult. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. That's what Peter says. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Trust, fight, work, hold fast. And what that means is we need to have this Patient diligence. Because, as we know, Reformation's always a long road. Um, It's a long road in your heart, isn't it? Um, Probably one of the greatest lines I heard uh, was John Piper. Somebody asked him, really an on-the-spot question in front of a whole conference. When do you most doubt God? He said, when I see how slow my sanctification has been. It takes a long time in our hearts. It takes a long time in our church. It takes a really long time in a denomination. And so if we're going to hold fast and fight, we have to have this patient diligence. Patient not freaking out, not quitting the moment there's a tiny setback or things go crazy, not, not wanting to leave right away, patient, but then diligent. Always doing the next thing. <laughs> Moving the ball down the field, yard by yard. It's like what we called smash mouth football. You just keep coming, <laughs> driving the ball up the middle, taking a yard, taking another yard, just keep Moving the ball down the field. And eventually you get done and you go, look what God has done. Calvin said that about his church. He said, there's many other things besides which, although we desire intensely to see them amended, we find no means of doing so. (laughs) But unless it can be accomplished by faith, by diligence and by perseverance on the part of all. Then it might 
something might happen. Faithful, patient diligence. Moving the ball down the court. I appreciate uh, Eric preaching on Hebrews 12 last night. And I want to, I'm not going to spend very long on it because he covered it. But I want to kind of reframe this. And help us remember, you know, our passage for the conference is Hebrews 10. Hold fast, for he who promised is faithful. We go to Hebrews 11, which we've typically called the hall of faith. Um, But maybe it would be better if we said it's a testimony to God's faithfulness. It's saying, hey, here's a whole chapter showing you how he who promised has been faithful. And will continue to be faithful. And then we read this. So now let us run with endurance the race set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. How do we not grow weary and faint-hearted? How do we hold fast? How do we keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation? We hold fast because he was promised as faithful. We look to Jesus who held fast because he knew he who promised was faithful. We look to Jesus, whole life suffering, he said, he who promises faithful, my father is faithful. He promised that he will raise me again from the dead. Conquer sin and death. He who promises faithful. We look to Jesus who did that for us. He lived, died, rose again. He was faithful because we're unfaithful. And he lived and died and rose again so that you could be forgiven. So you could be cleansed. And so you could be renewed, restored into the image of God. Which means he died. Not that, don't think I'm downplaying this. Not just so that you can have your sins forgiven. So that you could hold fast. And so that you could know that he who promised is faithful. So you could hold fast in the process of sanctification. You could hold fast in the process of leading your church. And I would say so that you can hold fast in the process of fighting for reformation in the CRC. And because we know that you promised is faithful, we know God's going to do it. Because God never starts something he doesn't finish. Ever. He always finishes what he starts. Every single time. When he called you to faith and he made you born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, I'll finish that work in you. I'm the author and perfecter of your faith. He promised to build his church. He started that work in the church. Guess what? He will finish it. And I think... To be even more specific, as we've already said today, God started a work in the CRC. And he will finish it. Because he who promised is faithful. Calvin said this at the very end. I think this was this is great. He says, What what therefore are we to do? Let's call upon the name of the Lord. Beseech him that he will rule by his direction this greatest and most weighty of all causes in which both his own glory and the safety of the church are bound up together. And also that in so critical a conjuncture of affairs in his own set time he would show that nothing is more precious to him than the heavenly wisdom which he has revealed to us in the gospel. And those souls which he has redeemed with the sacred blood of his own son. On that account, therefore, we must both seek and knock 
with frequent importunity and with our whole heart and mind to ascertain his will and more un- and the more uncertain everything on all hands appears to us when we weigh and consider carefully the whole course and progress of this work of reformation we shall find that he himself had overruled it by wonderful methods all the events in providence without the advice or help of man even contrary to all expectation upon this strength therefore which he has so often put forth on our behalf, let us, in the midst of so much perplexity, place our whole and entire dependence. He will do it. He's faithful. So Paul says, I like Paul's better than Calvin's. Paul says this in Thessalonians, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Because he always finishes what he starts. In your life, in your church, and in this denomination. Because he's faithful. And so... Hold fast, stand firm, and fight. Not as someone who's strong and wise and worthy, but fight as someone whose God has promised. And he will do it. Let's come to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, We come to you in your power and your grace and your glory. um, And we recognize our own frailty. Um, And we confess that we have often thought too highly of ourselves. We have often relied on ourselves, our own strength, our own power. And we have not trusted in your steadfast love and faithfulness. So Father, forgive us and cleanse us, renew us. Father, fill us with your spirit anew and transform our hearts so that we would leave from here no longer trusting in ourselves, but more fully each day trusting in your steadfast love and faithfulness. Father, we know we need your strength to hold fast. Grant it, we pray. And then, Father, use that. Father, we ask that you would finish the work that you've started in our own lives, in our own hearts. We ask that you would finish the work that you've started in our churches In particular for this conference, Father, we pray that you would finish the work that you've started in this denomination. We know you are faithful and you will surely do it. And all God's people said, amen. That's all we have for this week. If you want to help us out and support the Messy Reformation, another thing you can do is head on over to themessyreformation.com, look in the menu bar and find Join the Reformation. By clicking on that, you can sign up for our newsletter where you'll get episodes sent right directly to your email inbox, and it will give us the opportunity to communicate with our audience, which is one of the biggest struggles of a podcast. So head on over there and sign up for our newsletter. Now, stay tuned next week to hear our conversation with Patrick Anthony. But until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season. And keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.